Hi, this is Kim Bellamere presenting on behalf of the Grassland Heritage Foundation. We want to thank CEP for inviting us to participate in this video series. I'm really, really excited to be a part of it. Today we're talking about tall grass prairies and climate change. And this is a somewhat basic overview. Prairies are complex and their relationship to climate change will be similarly complex. We're also learning more every day, but in order to really analyze that information, we need to have a good, function, a good foundation of understanding. So today we're going to talk about what prairie is, how it can help with climate change mitigation, and why its preservation is so important in the face of a changing climate. So what is a prairie? If you've grown up in Kansas or lived here for any length of time, you've heard about prairie, sometimes more than you'd probably like. So what do you think of when you hear the word prairie? A lot of us think about these prairie symbols, western meadowlark, bison, sunflowers, and of course the sea of grass. The reality is that prairie is so much more than those symbols and it's definitely much more than a bunch of grass and buffalo. The truth is the North American tall grass prairie is one of the most diverse ecosystems on the planet with more plant and animal species than almost anywhere on earth. In fact, according to the National Park Service, it is surpassed in plant and animal diversity only by the rainforests of Brazil and is one of the most complex and diverse ecosystems on the planet. Okay, so what is a prairie really? Well, it is a grassland, which means that there are few trees and it is dominated by grasses, but not just grasses. There are hundreds of types of forbs or flowering plants in the prairie as well. Three major forces shape the prairie, fire, both lit by humans and nature, and predominantly the natural ones were lit by um, lightning strikes. Grazing by large herbivores, of course bison, but also deer, or pronghorn, and in some places elk. And finally, drought, or highly variable weather conditions. If you spent any time in Kansas, you know that we can have big weather swings, both year to year and sometimes even within a week and maybe even sometimes within a day. Those forces help create the plant diversity that the prairie displays. And prairie was once North America's largest continuous ecosystem stretching from Canada into Texas and possibly even into Mexico. However, today, only one to 4% of the pre-European settlement tall grass prairie acreage is still in existence. And most of that is in the Flint Hills of Kansas and Oklahoma. These maps really illustrate how much prairie we've lost. On the left, you see where we think the prairie existed prior to European settlement, and on the right, you can see about where it exists today. While there are pockets and remnants of prairies left in many other states, particularly in Nebraska, the last remaining large expanse of prairie anywhere in the world exists in the Flint Hills region. We Kansans are incredibly lucky because we are the stewards of the last large expanse of, the, of prairie, at least tall grass prairie, and all of us can play a role in this preservation. Landowners and land managers obviously play an important role, but even those of us who just love prairie can play a part by working to slow the advance of climate change and advocating for the prairie's restoration and protection. So let's take a look at prairie a little closer to home. The lighter orange shows where the prairie once existed in our area, and the darker orange shows where it still remains. As you can see, with the exception of some smaller remnants scattered throughout the region, the largest expanse of prairie still in existence is in Kansas. Okay, well, so what? Why does that matter? And why do we need prairie anyway? There are many, many reasons to preserve prairie, but let's take a look at the three big ones. First, prairies protect water quality and quantity. On this slide, you can see a few statistics about how much water a prairie can absorb, and you can see, that prairie, and you can see the prairies act like sponges. About a third of the prairie's roots, or the roots of a prairie's plants, die every year, and as they decompose, they aerate the soil, providing spaces for water to infiltrate, and they add hummus as they decompose, which also aids in holding water. And, of course, hundreds or thousands of years of plants growing and dying means that the soil builds up a great amount of hummus and fertility, which is related to our next slide, and that is our second point prairies have great soil quality. As I said, hundreds or even thousands of years of plant turnover has led to the building of rich, fertile soil. That's the reason the prairie has largely disappeared, to be perfectly honest. That rich, high-quality soil is great for growing crops. And most of the tall grass prairie was tilled for agriculture or developed for other purposes. 
The Flint Hills region has, was spared simply because it was too rocky to till, and it was a great place for grazing livestock. Now this is probably one of the most important reasons to preserve prairie. Pollinators and other wildlife need prairie plants found in prairies, or need the native plants found in prairies. And the reason is very simple, but it's easy to overlook. Most native insects must eat the plants with which they co-evolved. Now, they cannot consume or they cannot eat the plants from other areas simply because they cannot digest the chemical compounds found in those plants. And that isn't true of all insects, but it's certainly true of many or most of them. Now, if you're a gardener like me, you might think, oh, that's great. I don't want insects to eat my plants. But the truth is almost everything else depends on those insects, or at least many, many things do. For example, 96% of North American birds feed insects to their newly hatched chicks. And that includes things we don't think of as insect eaters, like raptors and hummingbirds and a lot of seed eaters. For example, the, um, the black-capped chickadee, in the time, in the two weeks from when its clutch of eggs hatch to when those chicks fledge two weeks later, they will consume at least 5,000 caterpillars. Now, if we don't have native plants in the ecosystem for those caterpillars to eat, then we will have fewer insects for birds to eat. And it isn't just our birds. Pollinators, too, need those native plants. For example, pollinators, mostly bees, are responsible for about 30% of the food we eat, meaning they pollinate that food. And that includes things like tomatoes and peppers and blueberries. Now, they can't only eat the things we eat, and they have to eat things other than the things we care about. So by providing native plants in our landscape, we're giving them other food sources. Now we need pollinators and our native insects because everything else depends on them and the insects depend on the plants. And we are the only ones that care about this too. Other animals like amphibians, reptiles, spiders, and even large animals like foxes and coyotes, they eat insects as well. So in addition to food, Native um, plants also provide shelter, building material, and places for our native insects and our native animals to live. Okay, so we want to preserve prairies because they have some great attributes like flood control and, and places for wildlife to live. But what does that actually have to do with climate change? Well, Research by the Nature Conservancy and other institutions has demonstrated that nature-based solutions can provide up to 37% of the emissions reductions needed by 2030 to keep global temperature increases under 2 degrees Celsius. That's 30% more than some previous studies have estimated. That means that various natural solutions, grassland restoration and preservation among them, can help reduce atmospheric carbon levels if properly applied. Reforestation is possibly from looking at the TNC study the best, or it sequesters the highest amount of carbon, but the, but the avoidance of grassland conversion and the restoration of grasslands can also play a really important part, along with other natural solutions like various agricultural practices, including the use of cover crops and better management of cropland nutrients and even the use of biochar. So how does carbon sequestration occur in soils? Well, plants take in carbon dioxide for photosynthesis. Through that photosynthetic process, some carbon is converted to food for the plants, or in the majority of it, most likely. And then what isn't used for plant processes can be extruded through the root system, where it interacts with the soil fauna and microbes to be fixed in the soil. Additionally, as a plant dies, some carbon is returned to the soil through decomposition. And if you're a gardener, you already understand this process. Many of us garden with compost because we want to increase the nutrient level in our soils. Part of that compost is carbon that has come from decomposing plant material. So the key takeaway is that the preservation of native prairie and where appropriate the reconstruction of prairie can result in the sequestration of an awful lot of carbon. In native prairies, if they're well managed, native prairies can maintain a balance between soil and atmospheric carbon levels. 
restored prairie has the potential to increase the amount of carbon in the soil until it reaches a steady state. And it is a potential and maybe very effective tool in mitigating climate change. Estimates vary, and it's an area of intense research right now, but one estimate by the U.S. Forest Service indicates that some prairies can store 22 tons of carbon per acre, and that's on native shortgrass prairie. Other estimates on tallgrass prairie put the number higher. So the long and the short of it is preserving native prairie keeps carbon in the ground, and tilling up that prairie releases it to the atmosphere. Okay, so prairie sequester carbon, and that is really important, but carbon sequestration can't be the only consideration when mitigating the impact of climate change in Kansas. Also from the same study, another striking aspect of these pathways, natural climate solutions, is the additional benefits they provide. Most nature climate solutions, if effectively implemented, also offer water filtration, flood buffering, improved soil health, protection of biodiversity habitat, and enhanced climate resilience. I'd like to take a moment to address an issue that comes up occasionally in our work. The Nature Conservancy study notes that reforestation may result in more sequestration than grassland reconstruction. And that's a little simplistic, but that aside, so many people think we should just start planting trees here. But Kansas isn't a forest ecosystem. The vast majority of Kansas historically was prairie, both short grass prairie out west, mixed grass kind of in the middle, and eastern tall and tall grass in the east. If we just plant trees here in an effort to sequester carbon, we'll lose the other benefits that prairie provide, including wildlife habitat and plant diversity. And all of those ecosystem services that prairies already provide are going to continue to be important as the climate changes. We already know that native insects rely on the native plants found in prairies and other wildlife and we humans rely on those insects. Tall grass prairie in the Great Plains region is already highly fragmented. Information from the National Climate Assessment indicates that that fragmentation may increase, which will hinder the movement of animals throughout the region. At the same time, many animal and plant species will need to move to higher elevations or more northern locations in order to survive. Climate change is also happening fast, faster than most species can move, unfortunately. Research indicates, or recent studies have also shown, that those that can move more quickly have a better chance of survival. The preservation of tall grass prairie, reconstruction of prairies, and even putting native plants in gardens will provide food and shelter for migrating species as well as those that are unable to move. The key thing to remember is diversity is resilience. Ensuring the preservation of a diverse ecosystem will help us all, plants and animals and humans, to be more resilient. Flood control will become even more important in a changing climate as well. Information from the National Climate Assessment indicates extreme rainfall events and flooding have already increased during the last century, and these trends are expected to continue, causing erosion, declining water quality, and negative impacts on transportation, ag, human health, and infrastructure. And we're already seeing that flooding today. We've already talked about how prairies and native plants can help with water quality and flood control. One important tool to have in our adaptation toolbox is to preserve prairies and the natives that we have and to plant more natives where we can. And the flood control benefits don't just apply to prairies either. Restoring riparian buffers and taking steps in farm and urban settings to increase native plants will help as well. So what will happen if climate change continues? Will it impact the prairie? As we've talked about, the prairie ecosystem is complex and climate change's impact on it and its response to climate change will be similarly complex. While I've outlined a lot of info in a short time, note that there's a lot we don't know. But luckily, research is really ramping up and we're learning more all the time. I think it's also ironic that while the prairie can help us adapt to and mitigate the impact of climate change, climate change has the potential to dramatically impact the prairie as well. Again, it's a pretty complex issue. That said, here are a few of the potentially many impacts we'll see. Of course, we've talked about species migration. In reality, it's already happening. Some information indicates that some species must move by the end of the century to a higher altitude or a northern territory in order to simply survive. 
Second, we'll see more invasive species, or potentially we will. This will do, could potentially be due in part to weakened ecosystems, which are more, more vulnerable to invasion, but also changing con conditions may favor some invasives, both plant and animal. And finally, we may see more woody species invading the prairie. There's a lot of research being conducted right now in the state at both Kansas State and KU on this issue. Remember, praise or grasslands and invasion by woody trees and shrubs will likely change the species makeup. So what can you do to help preserve the ecosystem? First, do all the things we need to do to slow climate change. Drive less, consume less, and support renewable energy, among other things. But beyond that, Number one, educate yourself and others. Visit a prairie, go on a prairie walk, see one up close. We tend to only want to preserve the things we understand and feel a connection to. So get out there and see the prairie's beauty up close for yourself. Next, plant natives. And you don't have to have 100 acres to make an impact for wildlife. Plant natives in your backyard, at work, anywhere you can. Wildlife will thank you. And finally, get involved. Support organizations that are working to halt climate change and preserve our native ecosystems. Many organizations like CEP, GHF, and the other wealth partners are working on these issues and deserve your support. Donate your time and help further their efforts. This presentation was a brief overview to a very complex issue, so there's a lot more to learn. This is a very short list, but we think it's a good place to start to learn more about climate change and the tall grass prairie. If you want more detailed information on prairie specifically, look for research coming out of Kansas State University, the Nature Conservancy, the University of Kansas, and others. If you have any questions, please feel free to email the Grassland Heritage Foundation at grasslandheritage at gmail.com or check out the website at www.grasslandheritage.org.